I mean, as I said earlier, my name is Samson Pakat. I work for the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And uh, I must say that uh, having been involved in environmental education or maybe community engagement facilitation for so many years, you know, it was my hope that maybe one day I will get to a situation where, you know, I can actually come up with a systematic approach of community engagement facilitation. But my work has, like, taught me that, uh, you know, when you are dealing with uh, communities, really, there can never be a systematic approach to community engagement all the time. Hence, I spend most of my time having to plan. And the planning itself, you know, it extends to, like, understanding your audience, you know, in terms of how do people, you know, learn and all of those things. So, but uh, basically, the reason why I'm here today, I just want to, you know, share uh, one of the pilot projects, and especially when it comes to trying to respond to your sensitive environmental issues. I know that some, most of us are not uh, involved in sensitive environmental issues like, like poaching with dogs. So uh, the question that I always get all the time, you know, especially when it comes to sensitive environmental issues, why a need for community engagement facilitation? And especially, you know, with the type of people that I engage with, of which most of the time is usually community members from rural areas. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, I mean, when you talk about like biodiversity concepts, I mean, those are quite foreign. You can imagine, you know, a guy who lives in a rural part of Mpende. This biodiversity concept that we talk about, I think that uh, people really uh, don't have any information, you know, about. Hence, there is then a need to actually engage people on uh, community engagement, using community engagement facilitation. And then as part of our work, it's not an easy work, because at the end of the day, it's all about changing mindsets. And unfortunately, most of the people don't realize that it's a process. So it's something, it's something that cannot just happen overnight. It's a process. But of course, at the end of the day, community engagement facilitation you know, should really be uh, enhancing a process of people you know, to think critically about things or complexity thinking. And then this complexity thinking that I'm talking about, which is very, very essential, and especially when it comes to working with communities. Because, you know, when it comes to presentations, presentations are quite inspiring. But at the end of the day, the question that sometimes you have to ask yourself, how many people in your audience are able to put into practice, you know, what you spoke about as a presenter? So therefore, when you are working with communities, it has to be more than, like, presentation. It has to be more like engaging people in processes where they engage in <coughs> learning processes. And then when I talk about uh, this uh, complexity thinking, it's all about people using what they know to formulate new thinking or new, or new meaning. Hence, most of my work, you know, it's about understanding, you know, really how do people perceive issues, what sort, sort of uh, level of knowledge do they have, and how can they actually use that to make a new meaning of a, what I'm trying to actually engage them on. And of course, this has to be a participatory process. Hence, I said earlier, it can never be enough to just do a presentation and expect that people will change behavior. It doesn't work like that. They have to be part of the process. And in fact, rural women, they use a lot of uh, this concept of uh, complexity thinking, you know, especially as they counter the effects of climate change, be it to try and maybe uh, get firewood or maybe produce more food. So they use a lot of that. Then now we come, out, we, we, we come to the issue of poaching with dogs, which is what uh, today I'm here to present about. <laughs> <laughs> when you are confronted with your sensitive environmental issues, you know the first thing that comes to your mind, where to start? Like in this instant, as intervention measures, 
we've actually done education, awareness, and law enforcement. But then the question that I ask you today is, <coughs> have we really managed to solve a problem? Your guess is as good as mine. I hate to say this, but your guess is as good as mine. So therefore, it then brings me to another issue where, you know, I honestly believe that when it comes to those sensitive environmental issues, most of the time we have been reactive. When it comes to people that are, are really poaching with dogs, we sometimes feel that by intensifying our law enforcement strategies, we'll be able to solve the problem. But it hasn't, it hasn't worked. I'm talking from experience. It hasn't worked. To this day, there's a lot of poaching with dogs that is taking place in Guazuna Dali Midlands, because that's what we've been doing. We have to lock people. We think about like locking people, so we're being reactive. And why do I, th I, I feel that uh, we've been uh, reactive? Because I really think that not many of us has, have actually taken a step back, you know, so as to ask ourselves, really, the historical context of the issue of poaching with dogs. We hear about the fact that uh, King Shaka, I mean, initiated uh, in Nina, which was a uh, control hunting. So this hunting has been there for as long as one can actually remember. But now, seeing the extent of poaching that is taking place around this area, you know, as we try to formulate intervention measures, <coughs> we don't take into account that we need to really understand why are people engaging this. I mean, for example, you have a section of community members who still believe that uh, hunting with dogs is an authentic traditional practice. That's a fact. And of course, another thing, you also have a section of people who know that there are certain groups of people who are involved in, in, in hunting. Then, for example, be it maybe in a controlled manner with guns or so, where you get a permit and all of that. But uh, when it comes to communities, really, they sometimes find themselves in a situation where they feel that they are being targeted because they don't understand, you know, the relevant legislation to hunting and all of that. So which is why we have to really think very, very carefully as, as we solve this uh, problem. But of course, uh, in understanding, like, uh, this whole poaching with dogs, there are various, quite a number of things that we need to take into account. Environmental context. We haven't got a clue in terms of, like, how many animals, like, get killed, you know, when people are poaching with dogs. We tend to exaggerate. We tend to say that many animals like, you know, get killed by dogs, but we don't have proof. So I'm just gonna run through all of this. I'm not gonna explain all of them. But of course, these are the things that we have to actually, yeah, we have to actually consider. So now, being an environmental educator, community engagement facilitator, you know, I spend a lot of time reflecting on my practices because first and foremost, I am one person, I mean, who's never comfortable to actually work for a salary. So, in short, if I see that things are not going very well, I will be the first to actually admit that, no, I'm failing here. If it means putting my job on the line, so be it. Because how I, how I got involved in conservation, really, it wasn't motivated, you know, by getting a job or anything like that. I've been involved for as long as I can remember. But of course, you know, in... Uh, uh, working on this uh, uh, pilot project that I'm going to implement, I had to ask myself, I had to sit down and ask myself, you know, in terms of how do people learn? Of course, people learn by listening, reading, <coughs> observing, participating, questioning, uh, touching, and all of that. So, like having said that, and also in the back of my mind, you know, I, have, I had to actually, you know, say to myself that when it comes to poaching with dogs, we have to realize that this is one issue with a financial implication across the board. Most of the time, when we talk about poaching with dogs, we tend to be sympathetic to uh, landowners. But how about communities? How about who communities whom their livestock also, also you know, get killed in a process? And of course, it came to me saying that, you know, 
as much as people, as much as we might be seeing people as part of the problem, but it can also be part of the solution as well. And then I then work on like seven steps, you know, in terms of engaging the people that are involved in putting itself, in trying to get like, a, you know, ideas on how to actually try to resolve to this, uh, to resolve to this environmental issue. So the first step, it was a engagement process where I had to try and understand like the drivers, why are people really uh, involved in poaching with dogs? And then, you know, to my surprise, I mean, I mean, these guys said to me that during the course of the week, we are involved like in work and all of that, but on weekends, unfortunately, we don't have many extra moral activities. Hence, that's the reason why we engage in poaching with dogs. I didn't know that when I started this work. And then the idea of uh, fishing was presented by these guys. You know, to say that we would like to actually engage in fishing. Because in fishing, I mean, you can do it uh, lawfully. You don't have to run away whenever you see law enforcement officials. But of course, we know that these guys are competitive. So the fishing itself, you know, had to be attractive. So we organized a mini a fishing competition, not a mini fishing competition, over the Easter weekend where it's usually a time where poaching with dogs is quite rife. So we managed to actually have these guys for about three days fishing and competing. It was quite fun. And during that period, in the terror side of Milvatem, not a single case of poaching was reported. <laughs> yeah, but. And of course, these guys seeing the excitement that is derived from, you know, fishing itself. You know, they decided to make a return pledge that uh, you know they are prepared to actually look after environment, so they won't like uh, engage in poaching with dogs anymore. Because like this is like more cool than poaching with dogs. And then, then we took a, a decision that you know from our side. It can't be enough to just uh, have this as a social fishing initiative. You know, there has to be an education element to it. Hence, we then introduce uh, 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 water quality and the uh, poaching, the poaching subject. You know, is one of the things where which we want to actually use to center this whole initiative. You know, around. So there, we had to actually take them to vacant drift dam where. The fishing itself is still controlled there. People don't use like many roads and the littering is also uh, controlled. So for them to be able to see like areas where this is controlled, and the guys, I mean, were cut char chaffed and they came back and shared to the majority of the other members. And of course we use med media now to actually do the community engagement facilitation, like the education side of things on water quality. <coughs> We invited that to the Umgen Conservation Trust to be part of this initiative. The media was there as well. And these guys were able to actually say such amazing things about you know, this initiative and how supportive are they to what we're trying to uh, achieve. And of course, we had to do a follow-up June 16, long weekend again, where poaching with dogs is quite rife. And then this time, the initiative was able to so at this time, the initiative was able to attract more people that are involved in poaching with dogs. People from Peter Marsville, people from Impen, the people from East Court were part of this group. Because I think the main thing about this initiative, you know, is the fact that these guys were able to talk to some of the people that are involved in poaching in a language that they understand. That guys, wait a minute, how about we try like responsible fishing. So it was a, quite a, a successful uh, uh, initiative. Then uh, the seventh step, the formulation of a, a community-based angling club was established. And I must say that myself as a community engagement facilitator, my role in this whole process, I mean, it hasn't been much because I wanted people to actually take ownership. Hence, they formed the club by themselves. I'm just there to actually advise them. At this point in time, the club has like 63 meters, I mean 63 members, and the WhatsApp group has been created where they are reporting uh, 
cases of poaching with dogs and also some uh, suspicious activities by the terror side of media, Midma, and I'm using those reports to actually feed into uh, our local district conservation officer. That's the last point. Okay. And now, where to from now? And from our side, if funding permits, we hope to be able to actually train these guys to be, guys to be able to use a, an SA campaign, can, SA can, uh, app, which has been used to actually you know, report cases of uh, poaching with dogs. And in fact, these guys are very, very committed. Not so long ago, in July, they actually chased one member of this club because he was involved, you know, in hunting with dogs. Hence, he was part of the group. Because as part of the pledge, they said members should not be involved in poaching with dogs. And that guy, in defending himself, he said that, no, I wasn't uh, hunting with dogs at the Taylor site. I was hunting in another area. But of course, the members didn't want anything to do with it or so. But basically, that is my short story. But of course, just to say that, really, in conclusion, just to say that as much as we might be seeing people as part of the problem, but they can also be part of a solution. And then personally, I mean, I've seen this in play. Thank you very much.